Admiral Cistern sat at his desk and overlooked the bridge of the dauntless through tinted glass. They knew he was watching, but never how closely. Little bits of paranoia kept men working good and hard. The whole mission was a cock-up from beginning to end. They had supplies and resources enough for a century-long trip. If the recycling techniques worked half as well as the hydroponic bays, and they did, the men were motivated and proud as well. The enemies that revealed themselves were incompetent when they weren't trivial to subvert or recruit. It was the other things that were a problem. A big one. Best he could tell the entire galaxy would be ravenously eyeing up Earth and any territory any of its sovereign states claimed due to the sheer gender ratio. The fact that this mistake was made was reasonable. It was considered a general sign of sapience in the galaxy at large to have a species with a massive gender divide favoring females. It allowed a race to thrive with fewer resources and ensure that the best pass on, but only if a thinking mind directed things. At least that was the general science before humanity came screaming into the scene. Apparently his species is becoming the exception that proves the rule bit of bullock. There is nothing I can do to stop my species from being the gigolos of the galaxy, he moans to himself. Our weapons outrange common hardware by a factor of ten and outright ignore the most common defenses. We are functionally immune to the standard methods of non-lethal takedowns. But no, we're male, so we can only be breeders and such. He picks up a data slate and peruses it. The information the galaxy has on his species. Bipedal, mammalian, omnivorous, 100 per 100, number one. Species name, human. Home world, Earth. Sector, cruel space. No, these are not typos. No, this is not a mistake. A species with an obscene gender ratio has been found in the least habitable part of the galaxy. If not for the unusual gender ratio, they would be BMO number 284. The tinny voice of the data slate reads out to him. He presses the button for further elaboration. Bipedal. The human species walks upright and upon two limbs like much of the galaxy. They have a very close resemblance to many lizard and ape descent strains of sapient in that the extremities of their locomotion limbs are effectively modified, grasping appendages. They have an unusual and rare cooling system known as sweating. This process causes them to secrete oils, which rapidly evaporate and carry away heat from the body. This process also unleashes an enormous amount of pheromones in the air during the heat or rut phases of the species that use them. It should be noted that humans are effectively in heat from puberty to impotence. The data slate chimes up, and Admiral Cistern sighs. Mammalian. The human species is a warm-blooded and furred species. Although their fur appears quite sparse, superficially they closely resemble BMO-1100 number 3, and likely share a similar biological ancestry in large apes that adapted to tool use. Interestingly, as they have evolved in the greatest natural null deposit in the galaxy, colloquially known as cruel space, they are likely immune to its effects. This has yet to be proven. Preliminary genetic tests and scans of their own databases prove them to have the acclimatization strains, allowing them to breed with any other member of the galactic community. They have long dubbed this vital portion of the DNA as the junk strains, as they were unable to decipher its purpose and assumed it as leftover and deactivated portions of the genetic code. It continues, and Admiral Cistern nods as he pulls out a small flask of good drink and takes a swig. Om, omnivorous. This is where humans begin showing truly exotic traits. Their unfortunate evolution in the middle of cruel space and lack of any form of axiom energy during their evolution as a species or culture has forced them to truly stretch the definition of omnivore. Great care is to be used in eating any form of human food as their tolerances for poison is unrivaled and they consider many deadly substances and plants to be simple and stable parts of their diets. In particular, the crowd control and riot suppressant chemical weapons known as Wicked Winter and Ferocious Flame are considered mere flavors, minty and spicy, respectively, and are often used in candies and meals. Furthermore, dangerous chemical stimulants are considered part of common recreational drinks that are universally available among both military and civilian population. They have dubbed it caffeine, and it is available to even small children. Scanning equipment is recommended at all times. It reads out and Admiral Cistern mentally chuckles. 
The spiced chicken dinner that had been offered to the ambassador had not gone over well, nor had the dinner mints meant as a palate cleanser or a friendly chat with coffee and biscuits. Still, if these classifications were anything to be considered, it appeared they were understanding about that debacle. 100 per 100 the humans are the only sapient species in the known galaxy with an equal number of males to females. Current evaluations determine this to be a defensive survival trait against the sheer danger born of living in cruel space. The sheer lethality of their homeworld and this adaptation to it has caused massive cultural divides between themselves and the rest of the galaxy. To the humans, males are the expendable gender— and are the ones that act as both warrior and laborer in their communities. That one was almost clinical, though the implication that Earth is exceptionally dangerous in some capacity does mean that colonization will likely be quite easy, so the main problem will be getting people off Earth and out of cruel space after that the other planets and peoples will fight to line up and offer them space. Number one. Though in many respects all races are unique in the galaxy, humans hold truly one-of-a-kind qualifications due to their ratio between male and female and utter lack of axiom energy in any form of their society. The diplomatic vessel Dauntless is their first major project into axiom technology, and they have proven to be an incredibly industrious species having built a massive vessel in a period of time rivaling a minor shipyard without any of the standard support structure or training required. Unfortunately, as a race, they have already been victimized by pirate attacks and lost a significant number of crew, suggesting that their martial capacities are not up to standard with the rest of the galaxy. Again, this is likely due to their lack of axiom energy around their homeworld. The slate belts out at him as he screws the top onto his whiskey and tucks it away. In conclusion, race BMO 100-100 Arvo 1 is likely to break out into the entertainment and escort industry. They will undoubtedly quickly fall into this niche and be rapidly seen in many worlds over the next few centuries. That is all currently known about species BMO 100-100 Ro 1, the humans. With that, the data slate stops talking at him, and he considers, as a man and a lifelong military man no less, this bothers him. This really bothers him. The idea that he would be expected to sell himself around a pole more than manning a gun. Or to be kept as a house husband and have his training and experience disregarded makes him want to spit. Yet he could not find a better option. Humans are behind with everything on top of being stranded in the middle of a massive spatial anomaly that cripples advanced technology. It was like being from a continent where fossil fuels and electricity simply did not work forcing everyone to rely on coal, not a bad standard of living, but nowhere near what the rest of the world would consider impressive. I'm one of the most powerful men on Earth, and often I'm at best a tight piece of ass in most circles. We're being humored by these cretins because they want boyfriends and husbands. He says to himself before exhaling an enormous lungful of air. The intercom on his desk beeps and he stabs the button without bothering to open his eyes. Admiral. The claw is safely docked and undergoing modifications to its transceiver and IFF for its new pseudonym. Furthermore, they are in the process of transferring not only the prisoner but a refugee requesting asylum. Also, Captain Lilpaw wishes to speak with you. I'm on my way, he says before standing up and marching out of his office. He quickly makes his way to the anti-gravity corridors through the ship and holds up his arm to the right wall. The magnetic rail grabs onto the patch of metal on his wrist. It has his rank insignia and name on top of being able to serve as armor in a pinch, but its main purpose was to adhere to the rail and numerous other small devices with a single strong magnet on them, usually ammo cartridges. After a few minutes, he holds out his left arm and catches a ladder that he swings himself onto and climbs back into the gravity field. His stomach threatens revolt, but is brought back into line. He marches solidly into the large cargo bay and glares down. Admiral on deck! A soldier shouts and the room turns to him with a salute. The aliens look confused by this, but that's what happens when you recruit from the scum of the galaxy. He snaps a salute back at both his workers and the brave, if suspect, men that had volunteered to live among the pirates, as you were soldiers, he says before turning and quickly getting on the lift. Moments later, and he's on the ground floor of Bay, 
and walks smartly through the crews that part around him in deference for his rank. Sir, our first mission was a complete success. Our malefactor one, Miss Karen Darkdown, is being escorted to the holding cells as we speak. We have all of her personal blackmail material, several of her weapons deposits, her ludicrously expensive wardrobe, and it was all disguised by the theft of several hundred thousand in physical credit discs and a massive carjacking operation. Commander Brent says with a salute, and Admiral Sister nods before glancing towards the bright red sports car with thrusters instead of wheels. Excellent. What is the price tag our good captain has placed on these pieces? He asks, before turning at the sound of claws clicking against the floor to behold the quadrupedal captain. He looked over her at first before glancing down. The fact that a fair portion of the galaxy walks on all fours and rears up to use tools or temporarily balance on their hind legs for intimidation purposes is still sinking in somewhat. It helps to think of them like a bear with thumbs. That's also a woman. Price? Oh, I do like this part. First off, the bitch. I want a million credits for her. I understand it'll take you some time, so consider it a debt you owe me. I'm keeping the dresses and the guns and money and the cars and, hmm, yeah, I'm keeping everything else and you owe me a million. Oh, but I'll swap a copy of the blackmail in exchange for an equal size copy of your movies and books and such, Lil Paw says with a smirk and then raises an eyebrow as Admiral Cistern smirks. An excellent bargain, Captain, and you don't have to wait for that million credits. I have brought over numerous goods and luxury items from the home world for trade and have sold a small amount for an enormous profit. Apparently, delicious exotic candy made almost exclusively by men is worth roughly ten times its weight in credits. Would you like your million credits in small units or larger ones? Larger ones, the hard credits we got in the raid were exclusively in smaller units. Lil Paw answers and he nods. Of course. Now I heard something about someone requesting refugee status? Right. Um, this awkward sir. Technically she's the daughter of our apprehended target sir, Commander Brent says, and Admiral Cistern gives him an even look. Sir, have you had the opportunity to study on robotics and artificial intelligences in the galaxy? My schedule has been extremely full. We're currently eating into my personal time soldier. Then I won't cut too deep into it, sir. They can't make robotic minds, but they can brain scan and copy minds into a digital space. As such, all robots are basically a person in a robot body, Brent explains, and it falls into place. Our refugee is a brain scan of Miss Darkdown? She is an abused, manipulated, and enslaved brain scan of Miss Karen Darkdown, sir. She was created on a power trip by Miss Darkdown, and kept in perpetual servitude until she suffered what appears to be severe disassociation from her organic self. Legally standing, a brain scan is considered to be either a second instance of the person in question or a direct relation, Brent explains. If the woman just wants shelter and rehabilitation, then we will help. Admiral Cistern and Commander Brent nods. Is there more? She's a mode shifter, sir, a transforming robot rabbit woman that's 20 feet tall when bipedal. Her other form is a luxury air car, Commander Brent says, and Admiral Cistern closes his eyes for a moment before taking a deep breath and exhaling. He opens them again and glances at what he thought was a sports car but is apparently the refugee requesting aid. That what you said makes complete sense is just... I fail to find the words. So long as she is not a danger to my men or my ship and is cooperative as a guest, I am willing to offer her refugee status in my capacity as Earth's main ambassador and admiral of its planetary navy, he says, before turning towards the car. Madam, provided this isn't some absurd prank by my soldier, could you please introduce yourself so I may begin the process of assigning you quarters? I... A digital woman's voice echoes from the car before there's a shifting of its... everything. It takes Admiral Cistern a moment to take in the twenty-foot-tall woman that looks like a playboy bunny in thigh-high boots and wearing opera gloves, all in red, with her skin the pitch-black leather of the car's interior. She even has a mess of wires and fiber optics for her hair, even as her ears twitch nervously. Biting back the obvious question of why a robot woman needs enormous breasts and an equally enormous rump, he simply nods. 
A pleasure to meet you, madam. I apologize that it's not under better circumstances, he says, and she takes a step back before kneeling down to better meet his gaze. You, it, thank you, is, is being this nice normal for your kind? She asks, and Admiral Sestern gives Commander Brent a sideways look. The soldier shrugs and mouths the words, good manners in English. Madam, you are a thinking being that have not in any way proven to be my enemy or an enemy of anything I care about. As such, there are basic manners you are owed, basic courtesies and deference to your own right to choose and as a person. Until you somehow prove yourself less or more than I will treat you the same as any other refugee asking for aid. As is so... You have asked for help and shall receive, madam. I don't care what your origin is, merely what we can do for you. He says, and the enormous alien robot rabbit woman shudders, shakes, and then bursts into tears before sweeping him up in an enormous hug and holding him close as she thanks him over and over again and begging for this to not be a dream and for it to finally be over. After an uncomfortable moment, Admiral Cistern hugs her around her head and she sniffs against him, the pinpricks of light that make up her facial expression shifting and twisting as she bawls into his torso. Captain, do we know how long Darkdown had her mode locked and defenseless? Commander Brent asks unsure about what to do about the spectacle happening in front of them, as a robot somehow produces both tears and mucus to smear into the Admiral's uniform in her distress. Long enough for a major breakdown, she answers in surprise. Several hours later. After the annoyance of calming down Miss Caddy Downshift, their refugee had requested a rechristening he had set her up with her own quarters and all but threw one of the ship's psychiatrists in there with her. He'll either end up with a broken pelvis, used as a plush toy, or actually help the poor woman, whichever it was the problem was averted for now. He took a fortifying sip of the coffin polish grade coffee he had ordered. Stressful days like this needed the old college trick where you ran the coffee through the grinds and filters a few times to concentrate it to the point of near lethality. Taking it with stomach pills is a must. After he gets to the halfway point, the door opens and he sees nine. Nope, the tenth of his pirate boys is racing up with a huge folder full of paper. Get in here. I want a full debriefing, he says, and they all march in. Followed by the tenth, Franklin skidding in and nearly plowing into the desk. What's the rush, soldier? Sorry, sir, I was organizing all my notes on the substances axiom and null and their possible military uses, sir. The ginger replies before standing up straight. He looks like he's been through a strainer and the bags under his eyes are so dark they resemble bruises. When was the last time you slept, soldier? Prior to the raid on Thorn Insurance, he says, and the rest of the men give pinched and annoyed looks before stealing themselves. Soldier, that was over two weeks ago. He remarks wondering exactly what the man is being fueled by and where more can be procured. I am aware, sir, however, what I have uncovered is far too valuable to ignore. Franklin says with a salute. I want a summary, he orders. The aliens have what is effectively magic, sir, and I've been pulling it apart and learning about it so that we can use it as well. I need more than that. Sir, Franklin says with a salute. We'll start with quick linguistic history. Axiom energy, which fuels all known exotic technology and even the very biology of alien life, was once called axis energy after a devolution of the term access energy, which was used in order to bring about a more scientific understanding of what was then known as magic. Basically, hoity-toity speak has devolved and mutated a few times to land magic on its current name of axiom. Makes sense. How can we use it? There are three known methods of using magic. We've gotten some very, very basic tutoring in using it in technology. The Dauntless is an example of such. The second is a spiritual methodology that resembles straight-up wizardry out of a fantasy novel. The easiest access we have to this is through medical texts and personnel of non-human origin, as Axiom is used for the majority of their more complicated techniques. Finally, there is a semi-monastic order of martial artists. Most major population centers have an enclave. These individual styles and schools have a dizzying amount of names, but all of them craft powerful totems that allow them to direct axiom into themselves and manifest weapons of pure energy. Common names include mansayers, flow users, masters of the art, and other such pretentious-sounding names. 
Both the spiritualist types and the martial artist types are often called adepts in common slang terminology. Impressive? Anything else? Admiral Cistern asks, wondering if he really does want to know any more. I have had some ideas, sir, and I believe I have discovered the foundations of a potential hybrid style. If it is widely practiced, then it is not widely advertised, but blending. What I understand of the totem users with the more spiritual methodology and my own engineering skills, I believe we may be able to make a series of techniques and skills that will allow for a great number of lateral options both on and off the battlefield. I hope you have some proof of this, soldier. This sounds rather too fantastical for easy digestion, Admiral Cistern says mildly and his eyebrows rise in surprise as Franklin nods. Let's see it. Very well, sir, he says. Putting the thick file folder on the desk before taking a step back, he pulls out a small brass-looking disc out of his pocket that has been carved into intricately and holds it in his left hand. Cistern recognizes it as a Kutha credit disc. Value 500 credits regardless of the vandalism. The oddly refracting metal holds that level of value as a metal. Franklin takes a breath, and the carved piece of currency starts glowing and floats over his hand. He then clasps his hands over it and pulls them apart with electricity arcing between them and riding up his fingers like a live Tesla coil. As the room stares at him, he suddenly wrenches his right hand up and the electricity gathers within it to ignite and become a dancing flame in the palm of his hand that he then crushes in his bare hand, then throws the energy at the rest of his fellow commanders. Their clothing and hair is blasted as if a strong wind had whipped around and tried to knock them all down. The nearer two actually take a step back to brace themselves a bit better, but no one is hurt. The basis of my style is not the sheer strength of will of a mancer or the oneness with everything that is the spiritualist, but based in the knowledge that all forms of energy are similar and with axiom interchangeable. I converted axiom to electric, electrical energy to thermal and thermal to kinetic, because I can use anything to make anything with some programming knowledge, I can also use it to remotely access computers and data networks that I have no possible way of getting into in any capacity. With your approval, I'd like to continue my studies and have these hard copies of my notes gone over by our scientists and researchers to see how viable this might be for us, sir. All right, put down your focus prototype and let me have these hard notes. Then go to bed. And only after you've had breakfast and a shower do I want you to transfer a digital copy of your notes to me. Understand? Admiral Cistern orders and Franklin nods before putting the thing down on top of the rest of the notes. The moment he's no longer in contact with the totem, he outright collapses to the floor, and before Admiral Cistern can stand fully upright to get a good look at him, he begins to snore. After a quick glance at the collapsed but unharmed soldier, he gives a little smile before sitting back down. Men, I am currently torn between annoyed, amused, and impressed. If there is nothing more for me, then, this meeting will reflect well on you. Is there more? Primarily observations to the behavioral patterns of the aliens, sir, Commander Brent says after a few moments, and Admiral Cistern gestures for him to continue. You've no doubt noticed that the pheromones of a human male are highly distracting and they are always eager to couple. Sister nods. Well, they also seem to imprint, for lack of a better term. Couple with them once, and they fixate on your specific pheromones to the exclusivity of others. This could possibly be used as a means to take control of organizations. Each of us is effectively in control of a large portion of the ship with this. So you have been coupling with them. Yes, sir. I'm not disparaging you, soldier. I'm just... I apologize. Continue. He orders, shaking out his own disgust. One of the main requirements for this mission was no regrets, meaning most soldiers were single, divorced, or surviving the departure of their loved ones. Admiral Cistern had a bit of a learned paranoia about women, as a man who had been thoroughly raked over the coals by a divorce lawyer and had his children taught to hate him. And since it was by the one he thought was his other half turned into his worst enemy— he felt it was a fair reaction. Once burned, twice shy. A particularly loud snore interrupts everyone's train of thought and Franklin jerks awake and groggily rises up. Apparently it was loud enough to wake him. 
The struggle to keep his laughter contained is something only Admiral Cistern wins, as the rest of the men start shaking and snorting in amusement as the other man wakes from his minute long nap. Oh, sorry, sir. I'll... I'll get that shower and breakfast, and then send you my notes, Franklin says as he starts to stagger out of the room. Get some proper rest, Salida? Eight hours at least. That's an order. Admiral Cistern admonishes him, and Franklin slowly turns around in his staggering, almost zombie-like gait. One can almost hear the gears slowly churning in the man's head. How long was I asleep, sir? About a minute, maybe two. I see. May I be dismissed, sir? I need a warm place to fall down into. I suggest a bed, dismissed soldier, Admiral Cistern says, and Franklin staggers out of the room. When we're done in here, make sure he's made it to at least a cot, understood? He adds the moment the door closes. Yes, sir. For a quick catch-up, we set up our workshop, recreation, and gymnasium stations in the pirate ship quickly and efficiently. And despite some misunderstandings, we've managed to quickly take social and emotional control of the entire ship. It feels kind of sleazy, sir, but they're hanging off our every word now and we won't even need veto powers to get them to avoid attacking some targets. I've been talking with the captain and she's not averse to legit trading and bounty hunting, but would need a new IFF for the ship. And we have provided one as the Earth Foreign Legion, or EFL Tiger. Admiral Cistern says calmly, So the plan is approved, sir? We shipped out with a massively bloated crew because we knew we would need either cannon fodder or manpower to either defend ourselves or take advantage of whatever situations the rest of the galaxy throws at us. Thankfully, we're taking advantage. With how many men are on our crew, we have enough to subvert an entire armada worth of pirates alone. It's not only approved, but is going to be used as the example for what to do going forwards. There's no way that the decision makers and captains of industry won't already have husbands, but their advisors, their secretaries, and those that relay their messages might not. Taking advantage of dirty politics, sir? We're going to have to. The Federation of Systems is a loose and ineffective conglomeration that has at most accomplished three things. A defense treaty that has never been put to the test, a widely accepted but not universal form of income in the form of galactic standard credits, and finally the galactic trade language which they accomplished by simply having an algorithm translate all their documents into it and refusing to answer to requests in any other language. The actual creation of the language was an experiment by over 5,000 different universities across nearly as many worlds working together. Admiral Cistern explains with his disdain, easily written over his face before he swallows it. Do we have a plan, sir? Commander Jake asks. We do. Now that I've been able to properly examine how we were attacked by the pirates, I find myself rather impressed. Their electronic warfare is inspired and caused us to waste most of our shots. I am also impressed with the level of sheer loyalty those girls have for you. As such, we have made contact with the pirates from ships other than the claw that attacked. They have been offered the same deal, and they all have accepted to the last. The Earth Foreign Legion is getting off the ground, boys, he says, and there's a nod from each. Which brings me to your part of the plan. Make sure Commander Smith gets this information as well. He orders and receives nine smart salutes. Good. Now we have roughly five ships incoming to be recruited, yet a fleet of seven ships just isn't enough. Get your girls to start talking to their friends and family. See how many will take our offer to join up the EFL. Admiral Cistern orders, and there are nods all around. Excellent. If there's nothing else, then that will be all, he says, and after a moment of silence, he nods. Dismissed. As his soldiers give him nine textbook salutes and march out of the office, Admiral Cistern smiles to himself. Yes, the galaxy assumes that he and his are naught but pretty faces to be protected but they will never know just how much they will dance to the tune of Mother Earth.